Okay, greetings. Welcome to today's edition of the Massac Report. I am Carl Bodner, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest panelists. Joining us is Mrs. Vivian Siegel, a member of our English department who teaches journalism. Mr. Jared Kachmar, who serves as a permanent substitute and as a football coach. Senior Brad Swain and Senior Dara Rubin, who also is the editor of the Massac Free Press. The topic Excuse me, the topic we will address today is the growing problem of fan violence. Whether looking at youth, college, or professional sports, both inside and outside of sport venues have become more severe and more violent. Likewise, it can happen at a little league field, Columbus, Ohio, Lima, Peru, or Manchester, England. One has to wonder why this collective behavior of violence has not only increased, but one could argue also become tolerated. I want to remind our audience that this is an open forum and our panelists can freely comment on each other's ideas. Allow me to open with an observation upon which you can all comment. I am old enough to remember, and I'm fairly certain even our young panelists have seen older films in which see, they see fans at sporting events dressed not in sports clothing, but in dress shirts, ties, hats, suits, women in dresses or skirts, and blouses. The cultural standard was, were quite different in those days. Why do you think that was, and why has it so dramatically changed? So, any thoughts on that? Brad? Um, today our culture is very different from what it was back in, in the olden times. Our, our work and our home life are not as connected as they used to be. So at work men used to wear ties and suits to work almost daily. And now you see that culture changing where a man can wear jeans and just a, a button up shirt to work. So do you think that this casuality of style and it carries over into other things? Yes, the casuality of just being able to wear whatever you want to work or at home carries over into what you wear at sporting events. Anyone else have a thought they would share on that? Well, I'm thinking back to when Jackie Robinson uh, first came into the major, league, major leagues for baseball, back when people still dressed nicely to go to sporting events. And certainly the behavior that um, people displayed toward him was completely outrageous, unacceptable, racist. And um, so even back then when people were well dressed, there were terrible things said and done, although they looked better, perhaps, more formal. Um, how he was able to have the courage to tolerate the abuse he was put through, uh, no one really knows, but certainly it was there. Anyone else? Katera, any thoughts on that? Um, I think also nowadays you have, they make replica jerseys for people to wear and they have all this clothing for the sports teams. So now that they have all these things available, people would rather wear something to support their team rather than dress up for the event. So they have a closer identification with the team or, yeah. or the particular player? Yeah. Do you find yourself in agreement? I agree. I think that when the media puts it so they want to be, there's all these fantasy football games and everyone wants to be attached to who their team is. Okay? When you're wearing a jersey of somebody, you feel that you're a part of the team. You feel like you belong with that team. So nowadays they don't wear shirt and ties anymore. They want to wear hats that represent who they're trying to support. And that's what I think is going on. Do you think this makes people feel more security or more secure? care about themselves or with themselves that they can you know wear a Tom Brady jersey or whatever and find some kind of quasi connection I absolutely do but I'm kind of saving my thunder for my question Mr. Bodner okay all right well let's go to our second question Professor Robert Park and Herbert Bloomer have researched a subspecialty of sociology called collective behavior. Why do you think it is that we have so much emotion invested in our collective commitment to athletes and teams? So, Mrs. Siegel. Oh, well, um, let me say that um, I've been reading a little about this and some 
professors who study the psychology of sports say that fans become passionate about their team and find personal satisfaction in their team's wins. This is a quotation from a woman at Boston University. Um, she says that um, because we live in such a um, fractured social environment, people don't feel that they belong anymore. Families are fractured, society's fractured, that people tend to try to find some kind of connection with their sports teams, and it becomes a passionate one. And when you add to this strong identification um, something such as um, a lot of alcohol, or, uh, which can cause um, pretty rowdy behavior, or you add in um, racial and ethnic tensions, um, some of the professional soccer teams in Europe, uh, let's say in Scotland, the, there, in Glasgow, there's a team called the Rangers, and the fans of the Rangers are very much antagonistic toward the fans of the Celtics. One team is more Catholic, one team is more Protestant, so you have these sort of built-in, very virulent and violent rivalries associated with the team. Not and it's not just what, what uniform you have on or what you're wearing, but it, it's much more than that. It's a social, psychological, and sort of ethnic slash religious phenomenon in some cases. So are you suggesting that this fan attachment is something that the fan can use to validate this erratic, violent behavior? Yes, I think so. Um, it certainly is heightened also by the increasing violence on the field of play. The really vicious violence that you see in soccer matches and the increasing violence in our own American football matches, which is, I love watching football, but sometimes it's frightening. The violence is frightening. I mean, what about you young people? Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, this, this validation by wearing this uniform and makes it more tolerable or acceptable for me to behave almost animalistic? Mm -hmm. You know, people today are, have on Twitter and on these social medias, and with these athletes having these social medias, we feel closer to the athletes. We feel more connected with them and their team, so we can see what they're up to, so we can feel a connection with them and say, you know, I kind of feel like I'm part of the team because I know what they're up to and I know what they're doing. Does, does anyone have a thought about you know this whole idea that violence is part of entertainment? I mean that's that kind of makes me wonder that, that we look at the violence as an aspect or care characteristic of entertainment. Do you have any thought about that? I think it definitely is. I think also just the more that people tolerate it, the more entertaining it becomes because no one's trying to stop it and it's kind of like reality TV shows where you see these people doing these crazy stupid things but everyone watches it because they just find it so entertaining because they're not the ones involved in it. Isn't it kind of ironic then that we have the adults doing this and the adults then become the models for the young people? I agree. Back to the question where, like you said, how much emotion that we put into our commitment to the athletes. But, I mean, find me a young kid that is in the playground who doesn't look up to LeBron James or doesn't look up to Pac-Man Jones. So they look at these, they invest all their emotion into these, into these athletes. And then when these athletes do an erratic thing, like shoot up a nightclub as Pac-Man Jones did, now the young man or young woman, now they see that that's their favorite athlete and they put everything into them. Now they see that athlete acting like that. So we wonder why are our young society, why are the young kids in society doing this? Well, their favorite, their favorite athletes, they're the ones doing it. We see it on TV. I mean, when I was in the playground, I would always look up to Dan Marino. I would always try to find good role models. But those athletes make mistakes too. So if they're violent or if they're hitting their wife or if they're hitting somebody else and they do that, what do we expect? That's what the kids are going to do. They're going to follow the footsteps of their favorite athlete. So, when the athlete, so if we don't go after the athletes and try to change them, I don't think we could change the kids that are following them. And I think we see this even on the Little League fields I hear at times where, you know, fans, parents will go out, strike an umpire physically. I mean, it's, it's almost like a, uh, uh, a level of insanity, if I can be overtly critical. But it worries me. Even with when you look at the uh, WWF, all this wrestling, even though you know that that's not real, you know, we just thrive off of it. I mean, 
you know, and what a message to send an eight-year-old. Oh, if I hit Brad over the head with a chair, he'll still be able to get up and fight me. And it's, it's kind of like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, I think especially with youth sports, and it goes younger and younger all the time, the win at all costs mentality is very dangerous. You really don't want your young daughter or son um, assaulting another child on the field because they want to win, you know, or permanently injuring them. But it seems as though some parents really buy into that mentality. Win at all costs, do whatever it takes. If you trample the goalie and the goalie's got a terrible concussion, um, oh good, says one parent. Oh great, um, you did what you had to do to score the goal. I don't believe that. I think that's wrong. I don't think you should be teaching children to do that. And this physical uh, violence seems to be accentuated also with verbal Extend, uh, ex increased ver verbal vulgarities. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, it seems to validate why I should be able to be vulgar at the top of my lungs mm -hmm. at some player, some opponent. And I have to ask myself, if this is the present trend and direction we're heading in, will it even get worse? And I don't know, what do you think in terms of the future? Yeah, it's something we need to worry about. Cause, you know, one parent will always think that his his son or daughter will be better than the next guy's son or daughter. So he wants to be more competitive with that, which leads to their son being more comp son or daughter being more competitive and wanting to win every game, like Miss Siegel said. So we can validate, you know, it's okay to cheat as long as you don't get caught. <laughs> I mean, you never want to cheat because that's not not what. What, what makes sports great, but it's the competition aspect of it if, it, if it going too far from the parents. Okay. All right, let's go to our next question. I would like to raise another question that asks, can we agree that the collective behavior does not necessarily have to be negative? We all have seen fan behavior that is truly entertaining with college fans at places like Penn State, you know, when the whiteouts or the Steeler fans waving their terrible towels or fans doing a wave. However, it seems that recently fans, young and old, have trouble drawing lines between crossing over into violent and sometimes criminal conduct. Why do you think this has become so common? Any thoughts, Jerry? I mean, I would have to say exactly what Mrs. Siegel said. I mean, it goes back to the win at all cost attitude. And that's what we put, that's what the emphasis is, that's what we're teaching the kids, that's what the coaches are going to do. And I've seen it, I've been a fan since I was two years old when I was a Miami Dolphin fan. So I've been a fan, I've been a player, I've played at college, I've been a coach. Everywhere I've gone, it's been a win at all. That's the attitude that we get. So then the players that are with me and the fans that are with me, that's how they feel. It's life or death. So when they lose, they take it out negatively. They act violently, they're vulgar, they don't want to lose. So when they're that competitive, there's one thing to be competitive, it's another thing to be disrespectful and unprofessional. And that's the problem that we're getting into. And this, so this has to be something that uh, we have to de-sanction because it seems right. to have been sanctioned. Any comments from anyone else? Well, I'm reminded of your first question, Mr. Bodner. Um, I think that when the fans in the stadium all have the same shirt on, and many have the same color shirt for their team, and look alike, and many of them have their faces painted, they become more anonymous. And so their bad behavior, they might throw a beer bottle onto the field, or they might punch someone. Their bad behavior is kind of not them, because they are just a group of them, part of a mob. And their individuality is is um, decreased. So uh, it's easier to do something bad because you just feel part of a big collective group because of how you're dressed, how your face is painted, and how everyone else looks alike. Any thoughts from you young people about that? Um, well, just about the fans becoming violent. I think when their team is losing, they can't do anything about it. They're not the ones playing the game. And I think they, when they're so upset, I think just they turn to violence because there's nothing that they can actually do to support their team. What do you think, Brad? I would, I would love to add, add on to what Ms. Siegel said. When you have strength in numbers, but strength in numbers could also lead to being a bad thing. So when we're all in a group, 
there might be an idea that, well, they can't get all of us in trouble. So, like, yeah. adding to that, you want to, I don't know how to, how to word it, but, like, I thought you hit it perfectly saying strength in numbers, but it could also lead to trouble with that. Right, with mob behavior. Yeah, with mob behavior. So we go from being celebrative fans to uh, uh, vulgar, uh, violent, uh, external participants mm -hmm. that, you know, Jared Kachmar is playing for me or for us, and we're going to co coagulate our group on that set of bleachers or wherever we are and let the world know we're here. Well, the real irony, too, is that sports teams are not what they were 40 or 50 years ago. The, the people on professional sports teams are highly compensated with enormous salaries. And they'll go to whatever city gives them a better deal. They don't really have loyalty to a particular town. And yet the fans feel this huge loyalty to the team. It's, but it's not the way it was. You, you, didn't, you don't stay with the team forever unless you're a real major star. Uh, but we continue to have this need that somehow is fulfilled by professional sports for identifying, even though our heroes wander off to other teams pretty easily. And yet hold the stature and status of an icon. Right. And if he moves to my, or she moves to my city, uh, I've got another victory on my belt. Right. Exactly. Right. I'll tell you, it seems like we are in a real strange time. We are. We all have seen cases of fans behaving out of control, even outside the arena of competition, to the extent of rioting in streets, both on campuses or in cities, uh, celebrate a win or express anger over failure to win. What do you think causes the transition from being supportive fans to mob behavior? Dara? Um, I think it can be one of several things. I think one thing could be they're drunk, because that happens a lot of sporting events. Um, I also think that they can just be so upset because they have all this emotion invested into their teams. They feel like they're a part of it. And when their team loses, they lose also. And I think that just brings out a violent side in them. So if I'm wearing a Patriots jersey and I'm paying the big prices to go to that game, I've got an investment in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so I want compensation for that investment in the enterprise. That's kind of an interesting mindset, I would have to argue. What do you think? I would, I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's drugs and alcohol, which is the number one component of all this. I mean, like we were talking about before, in the 1940s, they would serve alcohol and they would serve beer, but people were respectful and they, they knew how to handle it. Nowadays, when you go to an arena or you go to a tailgate party that they call them for the NFL or Major League Soccer, the behavior that goes on is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, now it's not just having one or two beers. People are just there to absolutely get wasted and take advantage of what's going on. I mean, it's disgusting and it's disturbing. I know I've seen on uh, uh, ESPN, they ran a series about fan violence in sports, and it, it extends in the parking lot where people are getting beaten up and then left on the asphalt bleeding, and then the fans go in and enjoy the game. And uh, it's happened on numerous occasions, and it's kind of disheartening to think we get to that.